organized crime and, and capitalism are actually almost synonymous, although not quite. Um, but it's a good analogy. Uh, so Mackey is, is this very colorful, complex character. Uh, and this is a very famous song. Uh, uh, the best English version I actually uh, have heard and like is uh, uh, by uh, Louis Armstrong. I don't know if anybody has heard Louis Ar Armstrong's version. It's, it's quite good. Um, but no, many people have sung, sung it, uh, including some women like uh, Marianne Faithful. And her version is quite good too. Okay, so let's listen to this.
Okay, well, that was in German. So after German, maybe it's a good time to reflect on English, uh, which by comparison sounds uh, definitely melodious, uh, uh, mellifluous even. Uh, but I think uh, the key point about uh, Brecht uh, uh, is that uh, uh, he doesn't want to let us forget for a single moment what a brutal system, what a brutal world we live in. And it corrupts everybody. Uh, it corrupts every soul, including those uh, uh, who may be oppressed by it as well. So it's a, it's a very uh, uh, strange, alienated and alienating system, um, uh, which uh, at the same time can be very exciting too. Um, so people need their fixes. But uh, uh, before going on to uh, uh, more depressing things, I want to uh, uh, read to you something a little lighter, which is about English language itself, and then a song that Pete Seeger does on, on, on English. Uh, uh, this is from a book by Bill Bryson uh, called The Mother Tongue. Uh, Bryson is a very good writer. Uh, uh, he has written that book on Appalachian Trail, his, his travels through Appalachian Trail, and also a, a really beautiful book uh, delightful book on uh, uh, traveling through the coast of England uh, and many other books. So his first chapter is called The World's Language. Uh, more than 300 million people in the world speak English and the rest it sometimes seems try to. It would be charitable to say that the results are sometimes mixed. Um, of course, he's a bit out of date because by, the, by this time, 300 million probably should be changed to more like 500 or 600 million. Uh, but here are some examples of English that he has found. And this was before Yugoslavia broke up. Consider this hearty announcement in a Yugoslavian hotel. The flattening of underwear with pleasure is the job of the chambermaid. Turn to her straight away. Or this warning to motorists in Tokyo. When a passenger of the foot heave in sight, tootle the horn, trumpet at him melodiously at first. But if he still obstacles your passage, then tootle him with vigor. Or these instructions tracing a packet of convenience food from Italy. Be smear a baking pan. It's actually spelled uh, as backing pan. Previously buttered with a good tomato sauce. And after, Dispose the cannelloni, lightly distance between them in a, in, a, in a only couch. Well, A and N are too hard, really, for, for foreigners, if you ask me. Clearly, the writer of that message was not about to let a little ignorance of English stand in the way of a good meal. In fact, it would appear that one of the beauties of the English language is that, with even the most tenuous grasp, you can speak volumes if you show enough enthusiasm, a willingness to tootle with vigor, as it were. Anyway, I, I, I love many languages, including English. So, I, And if you like, you can, you can read this. Uh, another uh, good thing to read on English language, since you will be doing some writing, is this book by Andy Rooney. 
uh, it's a collection of many of his uh, pithy sayings uh, uh, called Common Nonsense Addressed to the Reading Public. And uh, uh, I'll just read you a few things uh, from this one because it's basically about uh, uh, beginnings of, of, of uh, good writing. Uh, and it's uh, 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 called by him, uh, in the beginning, there was a writer. And he begins by telling us, I don't want to burden you with a writer's problems, but one of the difficulties of writing is how to begin. Because I make my living doing it, I am always alert to how other writers start their reports, articles, essays, or novels. The first words of any piece of writing ought to do several things. They should inform, create some curiosity, and begin a story. That's the ideal, but few writers try to include all those elements. No one knows who did it, but the writer of the Bible knew what he or she was doing when the first words to set down were, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's an opening line that would be hard to improve on. There have been other great ones. Charles Dickens began his epic tale of two cities by writing, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I haven't seen the movie and I can't imagine how they could have used the great opening line of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And thereby hangs a tale, <laughs> or several. You can tell where that story is going. One of the great all-time first sentences was the one with which Margaret Mitchell began, Gone with the Wind. Scarlett O'Hara was not beautiful, but men seldom realized it when caught by her charm as the Tarleton twins were. We may not care who the Tarleton twins were, but we certainly acknowledge the truth in this sentence. Gore Vidal began his novel Myra Breckenridge by writing, I am Myra Breckenridge, whom no man shall ever possess. Pretty catchy. Anyone reading it would be curious to read on in order to find out whether any man does get to possess her. I know what my bet would be. And then some first lines have become classics for reasons that are hard to determine. Herman Melville wrote one of the most famous first lines ever set down when he began the story of the great white well, Moby Dick. His character said simply, call me Ishmael. Tolstoy starts Anna Karenina with a general statement, happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And then he says something ungenerous about Hemingway, which I shall not repeat. But uh, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, whom I like very much, and, and this is where I will let this end. Uh, my friend Kurt Vonnegut starts his classic Slaughterhouse-Five in a disarming way. All this happened, more or less. The war parts, anyway, are pretty much true. Uh, Vonnegut is a great writer, and, and a great uh, humane writer, uh, who again uh, does not close his eyes to the brutalities of this world. Um, okay, let's turn to Pete Seeger, wonderful Pete Seeger. Uh, he, uh, he sang this song, or it's more like a rap really, when he was 89 years old. Um, and he sang on his 90th birthday um, with Bruce Sp Springsteen, um, and maybe we'll get to hear that too. Which is the 
Okay, and, and it goes on, so you can listen to it later. Um, uh, it's really a fun song, and uh, people who um, uh, listen to rap don't realize that rap was not invented in the 1990s. Uh, it has existed, uh, if uh, you can go way back in the 19th century even, and, and, and find examples of proto-raps. But certainly, uh, in the 1930s, uh, Woody Guthrie, uh, uh, Pete Seeger, and others, uh, uh, did quite a few few raps and put them to very good political purpose as well. Um, uh, uh, let's turn to Bruce Springsteen, and that's basically why I had this thing in here, uh, because there is something very important about uh, people who uh, look at the world uh, with open eyes and, and, and don't really uh, uh, let that discourage them from a lifetime of struggle. And uh, Pete Seeger is a very good example because he's now 93 and uh, uh, he never gave up. In fact, uh, I find him one of the most inspiring living people I know. Uh, and I think you will find him inspiring as well. So that's why I included this strip. He sang Woody Guthrie's original version of This Land is Your Land with Pete Seeger at President Obama's inauguration this year. Headlined Sunday night's concert and began with a moving tribute to Seeger. As Pete and I traveled to Washington for President Obama's inaugural celebration, he told me the uh, he told me the entire story of We Shall Overcome, how it moved from a labor movement song and uh, with Pete's inspiration and then adopted by the civil rights movement. And um, that day as we sang this land is your land, I looked at Pete. The first black president of the United States was seated to his right, and I thought of uh, I thought of the incredible journey that, that Pete had taken. You know, my own growing up in the '60s, town scarred by race rioting, made that moment nearly unbelievable. And Pete had 30 extra years of struggle and real activism on his belt. He was so happy that day. It was like Pete. You outlasted the bastards, man. <laughs> it was so nice. It was so nice. At rehearsals the day before, it was freezing. It was like 15 degrees. And Pete was there. Uh, uh, he had his flannel shirt on. I said, man, you better wear something besides that flannel shirt. He says, yeah, I got my long johns on under this thing. <laughs> I said, and I asked him, I said, how do you want to approach this land as your land? And I said, be near the end of the show. And all he said was, well, I know I want to sing all the verses. You know, I want to sing all the ones that Woody wrote, especially the two that get left out, you know, about the private property and a relief office. And I thought, uh, of course, you know, that's, that's what Pete's done his whole life. He sings all the verses all the time, especially the ones that we'd like to leave out of our history as a people. You know? And, uh, at some point, at some point, Pete Seeger decided he'd be a walking, singing reminder of all of America's history. He'd be a living archive of America's music and conscience, a testament power of song and culture to nudge history along, to push American events towards more humane and justified ends. 
he would uh, have the audacity and the courage to sing in the voice of the people. Now, despite Pete's somewhat benign grandfatherly appearance, you know, he is a creature of a stubborn, defiant, and nasty optimism. <laughs> He carries, inside him, he carries a steely toughness that belies that grandfatherly facade, and it won't let him take a step back from the things he believes in. At 90, he remains a stealth dagger through the heart of our country's illusions about itself. Pete Seeger still sings all the verses all the time, and he reminds us of our immense failures as well as shining a light toward our better angels in the horizon where the country we've imagined and hold dear we hope awaits us. And on top of it, he never wears it on his sleeve. He's become comfortable and casual in this immense role. He's funny and very eccentric. You know, the song that uh, I'm going to bring Tommy on, the song Tommy Morello and I are about to sing, I wrote it in the mid-90s and it started as a conversation I was having with myself was an attempt to regain my own moorings and its last verse is the uh, beautiful speech that Tom Joad whispers to his mother at the end of the Grapes of Wrath it says uh, wherever there's a cop beating a guy wherever a hungry newborn baby cries wherever there's a fight against the blood and the hatred in the air look for me mom I'll be there well Pete has always been there Bruce Springsteen honoring Pete Seeger on his 90th birthday Sunday night at Madison Square Garden. Back at the inauguration, Springsteen, Pete Seeger, and Tao Rodriguez Seeger, Pete's grandson, sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, This Land is Your Land. Seeger, okay. Bruce Springsteen, and Tower Driggers Seeger at the inauguration <coughs> singing those off. Okay, now we are talking about language, language of film, uh, 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 but this uh, 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 language uh, is uh, uh, No, I want to say something first. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so uh, 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 that was Martin Luther King. But before we listen to to his, uh, I think this is a two-minute thing uh, about language. Uh, uh, I want to say a few things about uh, how um, uh, 
uh, we may speak a language, but it may not be our own. And in case of the slaves, of course, this is very obvious. Uh, uh, but even uh, in Ireland, uh, and you will remember that uh, Thiongo talks a lot about Ireland. He writes a lot about Ireland and, and, and uh, quotes an Irish writer uh, about the, uh, who uh, uh, talked about the corpse that sits up and talks. Um, and uh, uh, James Joyce, who is perhaps the greatest writer in, in English language ever, uh, he has this character, Stephen Daedalus, who is his own alter ego, uh, an Irish guy. Uh, and in um, uh, Ulysses, uh, there is a line uh, where Stephen Daedalus is talking about his English professor, who is English, English. Um, and he's talking about the English language, and um, uh, he utters the line that this language is his before it is mine. This language is his before it is mine. And then you have to think. I mean,